Uh, I'm Jonathan Rosenberg, and I ran product management here for 10 years. And I don't usually come and introduce speakers, but Anne is special. And so I came to tell you why. Since 2002, when I joined Google, my favorite days were Mondays. For 10 years, Monday morning was Eric and Larry's staff meeting, and I was surrounded by smart people with a mission that mattered. And in the afternoon, I would run my staff meeting. And my staff meeting was Sundar and Salar and Marissa. And the second smartest Wajiki sister. Is this being recorded? <laughs> Susan, I love you. And in 2011, when all of that ended and I moved out of an operational role, I thought I'd never have exciting Mondays again. Then Susan introduced me to Anne, and I started going to 23andMe's staff meeting and helping over there. So now on Mondays, once again, I'm surrounded by smart people, and I'm in a company where the mission, that, where the mission matters, bringing personalized medicine to like make us healthier, like we care about being healthier. So the mission is terrific. The team is brilliant. It's a little bit different because more than half of the faces in the room are women. And the CEO is a woman. And Katie and Jessica are here, some of the people who are in the staff meeting. In fact, more than half of the faces in the room are women, even when I'm there. I'm doing pretty well. So rather than kind of go through all the yada yada of a traditional introduction, you know, like Anne is special, and she went to Yale, and she spent 10 years doing like medicine and uh, healthcare investing, Anne is very googly. Look at the way she's dressed for her Google talk. <laughs> so listen to Anne, listen to her vision, listen to them talk, uh, Anne and Jordan talk about some of the great challenges that she's faced building 23andMe and many of the googly values that she's infused in this wonderful company. And Anne, you're the reason I get out of bed on Monday mornings. I love you. Okay, I'll turn things over to Ann and Jordan. All right, can you guys hear me? Okay, thank you for joining us here. I really appreciate it. Um, Ann, thank you for joining us. Of course, after an intro like that. I know, <laughs> can't beat that. Um, so for the first 45, 50 minutes, um, I'm gonna go with questions that I took from the Dory. So thank you all for submitting Dory questions. And then for the last 10 minutes, we'll do mixture of live questions and Dory questions. Um, but I wanted to start off first with your relationship here with Google and your yeah. story that you were telling me about you and the cafe. Yeah. So I obviously, um, I've known Google since the very earliest days. It started in my sister's garage. Um, so it was one of those things in, in the early days. We'd be doing dishes, and we could see Sergey and Larry coding in like the other bedroom. And I used to always say, I was like, it's really weird that you have these guys like just sitting in the other room coding while we're doing dishes. <laughs> like it was a really unusual. Um, so obviously I've spent a lot of time at the company and I was saying how um, 23andMe used to have an office um, on Shorebird, so just around the corner. And we're, you know, like we're a startup, we're scrappy. And um, so it was very apparent that, you know, Google had a lot of food. So we used to make our way over here. And, you know, back when there was burritos right downstairs, um, there was great burritos. And so they're easy to carry. So I would walk over every other Thursday and we'd have these team lunches and I'd just get like 10 burritos. And so I was walking out carrying like my, all my burritos. And I open the door and I look and it's Eric Schmidt and Steve Jobs. And I was like, oh, hi, you guys. Like, what are you doing? And Eric's like, what are you up to? I'm like, oh, just getting lunch. And Steve had just launched the iPhone and was like, have you seen the iPhone? Do you want to see it? I'm like, yeah, great. <laughs> so, um, so I've had a lot of great experiences. Um, I'm obviously such a huge fan of Google. And in, it, in a lot of ways, it's had a huge influence on 23andMe. And I think a lot of the values that um, I saw, especially in the early days, have really influenced how we've run the company. Now, you were mentioning about your values in 23andMe, mm -hmm. and you were telling me about your, your relationship with your grandmother and her mm -hmm. um, experience with the healthcare system. Can you talk a little about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, it, so as a background, I used to invest in healthcare companies, and, um, you know, healthcare is a really complicated industry, and it's not necessarily always doing the right thing for the consumer. And I used to always 
um, complain. Like I actually, the last fund, the last hedge fund I was at was a fund that we nicknamed Death Watch. And we used to just short everything because it's really easy to predict failures in biotech, but it's hard to predict successes. And so I was like, kind of just like this really negative, like everything sucks in healthcare. It's all bad. It's all failing. It's like all about like, how do I just take advantage of the consumer? And I remember Larry turning to me one day and he's like, Anne, you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Right now you're part of the problem. Um, I was like, oh, like that's true. Like in some ways it was a good slap of like, you have to, if you, when you see problems, you need to do something to change it. And one thing that we've always, my family has always been really passionate about is healthcare. And part of this came from the fact that my mother um, was, you know, she was very poor growing up and she had a little brother and when he was 18 months old, he got into a bottle of aspirin and he ate that bottle of aspirin and he was clearly lethargic. They took him from hospital to hospital to hospital. My mom was five at the time and um, they were refused treatment because they couldn't show proof of payment. They finally got some hospital to take him and um, they took him and then when my grandmother called in the morning, um, they said he was dead. And it had a huge impact on my mom as it would have on any family. And my mom at this time was like, you know, very clear, if you don't take care of yourself, no one will. And you have to be responsible for your healthcare. So when I pulled my Kaiser medical records at some point, um, my sisters and I discovered that our records actually had an asterisk at the top that said, as all of us in pediatrics know, this mother can be very irrational at times. And as Jonathan has had some, some lovely times also working with my mom, my mom is a force, um, and especially in healthcare. Like, we routinely get fired from doctors. We routinely are told people don't want to work with us. And I think it's one thing I've learned is, like, in some ways, good healthcare comes to those who complain. And you have to be really proactive. So it was one of those things, like, we were always a super proactive family, um, you know, understanding our health. And it was one of the things that I think really bothered me when I was investing in healthcare is I realized how much the system is not set up for your success. Like no one makes money if you, um, if you live to be 100 and you never are sick, no one makes money. You know, and healthcare is 18% of our GDP. Like clearly lots of people are making money off you being sick, but it's a real problem. And so a lot of my passion for 23andMe when I started the company came from how much I said, like, I want to do something that's genuinely right, that allows people to be active in their health and proactive the way my mother has always been proactive for me and that she's taught me to be proactive with my health. Can you talk about the first years of you building 23andMe, the challenges yeah. you went through? Mm -hmm. So we got lucky, um, you know, I think a lot of founders, like in, like Sergey and Larry used to say this, like they got lucky, they had the right place, right time. Um, I happened to be, when I was investing um, in, in, on Wall Street, I happened to realize like genetic information, it was suddenly cheap to get access to a broad amount of information on your genome. And, um, you know, I was really lucky noticing like one, you could get suddenly individuals could access to your genome. And then there was this whole convergence of like web 2.0, like there's gonna be social networks and you're gonna find each other. And it was like hot, it was so interesting and it was my space. And, um, and it suddenly realized um, one of the things that's a big issue in healthcare is there's a lack of data. So I like routinely, my sister, other sister does um, nutrition research and routinely you look at those studies and it's like 200 patients here, 200 here. And my dad, who's a particle physicist, would be like, anyone who knows about statistics knows like you can't find anything in this. Like you need lots of data. And clearly the Google world had taught me like the value of like lots of data and what you can do. Um, so I got lucky sort of with this idea of why do I need Stanford? Why do I need Pfizer to go and do all this research? I can just allow all these people to learn about their genome. Like it's so cool, learn about your genetics. And then we're gonna bring everyone together in this whole new research model. It's gonna be like crowdsourcing. We're gonna have the world's data. I don't need Stanford and Pfizer and all these other people. I don't want you to be a human subject. I want you to be a live participant, excited in research. Um, so we had this idea really marrying like this idea of cool technology with like this concept of like health, you know, web 2.0. And we launched the company. And um, you know, initially I had this enthusiasm, like I think genetics is so cool. Like I think there's nothing cooler than the idea is like you have a genetic code, everyone in this room is 99.5% the same, yet we clearly have all this diversity and we don't understand it. Like it's like the, it's, it's like, it's a code. Like how does it, how do people sleep at night? Like it's so interesting and we don't understand it. And so, um, so I had this enthusiasm 
Um, but I started to realize that the rest of the world's not quite as passionate about genetics as I am. Um, and so we launched, and we had a you know we had this big spit parties. We had all kinds of press, um, and then we sold probably a third a thousand kits the first day, and then we were selling like fifteen to twenty kits a day. And as everyone realizes, like 15 to 20 kits a day is not a lot of money. Like that is, that is that's not even going to be a ramen profitable company. Like that is, um, that, that's rough. Um, so it made me realize like we have to do a lot to help people understand like what are genetics. Like most people, um, like really smart people would come to me and be like, oh, I don't want to know my DNA. I don't want to know the day I'm going to die. And I was like, if I could tell you the day you're going to die, I'd charge you a lot more. Like, <laughs> I, what are you, idiot? Like, I, I, I was like, no, it's like risk. Like, and you realize like, most people don't understand risk. And um, so the thing that I've been lucky with is I have a team of people who join 23andMe because they're really passionate. And you know, my love for science, like I said, my father's a particle physicist. And as kids, my sisters and I grew up always like realizing, like we tell people, like, oh, my dad is like he studies neutrinos, he's searching for mass, and people were like, what? Like, what is he doing? And and I just realized, like, I, I in some ways, like, it always bothered me. I think physics is the most beautiful science out there, but like most people don't understand it. And um, I also like, and genetics is similar. Like, I really didn't want the fate that my father went through with physics of like, you know, lack of funding and all this. Like, I wanted the average individual to like see the beauty of the D of DNA and see it within their own lens and capture this idea of like, we're all most interested in ourselves, and so your DNA is really interesting to you. Um, so the people I hired in those early days, a lot of them are still at the company. And they're really passionate about this idea that like you want people to un like you want people to see that beauty, and um, and so I'm lucky because the fact that like it was hard those first years and like we didn't have huge sales, it didn't deter people, because they're like again scientists are used to failure. They're like well you know we just have to try this, we have to try that, we have to like try other strategies. So it was um, you know I'm lucky with that, and also the science. You know, one of the things that we did with the company that was unusual um, is we weren't excessively marketing um, because we decided, like, we wanted to really make sure that we had the science down before we did a lot of marketing. And the one marketing thing we did, this is another funny story, um, Sergey at this time, I don't know who's been here for how long, um, Sergey was really interested in Zeppelins, you know, blimps. Um, and so there was, a, there was a Zeppelin for a while. And Sergey didn't want to stick like a Google sticker on it. So he's like, I don't know, you could put 23andMe on it. So we put, because he wanted to sell advertising on it. So we put 23andMe sticker on it. And <laughs> it got a lot of press <laughs> that there was like a giant Zeppelin flying around town. Um, like TechCrunch had all these articles. So that was like my one attempt before we had a marketing team. I had the blimp. Um, I'm no longer part of the marketing team. Um, <laughs> but we really focus, like as a company too, in those early days, we recognize like we have no business if we don't have a scientific foundation. And that the core of the company, like I needed to win over the scientists and make sure that they understand what we're doing and that they're, a pre that they're supportive of what we're doing before I go big and start going on TV and start advertising. And in some ways that also really benefited the company because when there was controversy, I never had to worry about my core. Like, I always knew the foundation of the company was really strong. I didn't have to worry. Like, I understood it was misunderstood in all these ways, but scientifically, I was always solid. And I knew that. Excellent. And when you proposed a blimp idea, did you have to bring it up to your board or something? No, I think I think I just did it. You know, that's the beauty of a startup is like you don't even think about these things. I don't know. Like I just I just put it up there. No, I mean my board <laughs> has always been um, pretty small, and and I just like I you know again when you're a ten person company or a fifteen person company, you just like do things all the time that are kind of crazy. Like this when we launched our spit party in New York, we had Barry Diller um, host and like Rupert Murdoch, like all these people host this spit party, and. It was on the cover of the style section, on the Sunday style section. And I remember like, see, like, people like Eric Lander, like serious scientists, who were like, it is so disrespectful to have science on like, the style section. Like, this is not appropriate. And, um, and I was like, no, like, more people read the science sec or more people read the style section than they read Science Tuesday. Like, this is great. So we were always kind of doing things 
um, that were a little bit different. Like we wanted to do things, not to say like the blimp, but the blimp was fun. Um, but we wanted to do things that were going to be atypical of what the traditional scientific world does. Because like most people are not out reading New England Journal and Science Magazine. Like we want to bring science to the masses. Excellent. Um, uh, when I had Ben Horowitz here, we mm -hmm. talked about the struggle that CEOs go through where it's just a really challenging time. Yeah. And you have to really fight through it to survive. Um, it seemed like the struggle for you was during that whole FDA period. Can you talk to us about that? And then also what kept you going during that time? You know, I think, um, I think I've had two struggles in the company. So the FDA one was clearly um, an important one. And it was in some ways it was the most public. And it forced us to really change our strategy. And... Um, you know, we got what happens, we got the letter. We got the FDA warning letter on a Friday. And I was at a team offsite. We were at a strategy offsite. We were like talking about like we have massive growth. We were really excited. We were going for a million people. Um, and my assistant at the time texted me and she said, You got um, a, a special, del like the, the FDA is trying to curry or something to you. And I was like, Well, don't sign for it. Um, and, <laughs> and, she, and she was like, I already did. I was like, Oh, why'd you sign for it? Um, and then I was like, bring it to me. And, um, and then we read it, you know, and we were like, we'd gotten a lot of warning letters in the past. Like we were kind of used to it by then. We we're like, yeah, you know, whatever. We get them all the time. Um, but this one was like a lot more serious. Um, and, and to be honest, like Silicon Valley is not known for its interaction with regulators. Um, so it, I was like, I think we were relatively naive. Like I get this question a lot, like were we just like so arrogant we'd kind of given the finger to the FDA or were we just incompetent? And I think it's that we were just uneducated. Like we, um, like it took me a while even after getting that letter because then it was made public on Monday morning. And, um, and people would read it and they're like, wow, this is like, like this is probably one of the most serious um, warning letters that's ever been put out there. And it was actually one of the former heads of the FDA who called me and was like, Ann, like, they're not messing around. Like, you have to stop. Um, and and it, was a, it, was, it, it definitely it halted a lot within the company. And that first week, I think I just spent the entire week in my pajamas calling lawyers. Like, I just, I didn't move from my desk. I just called. And for me, I've always been very data-driven. Like, I just wanted all the information. So I was just pulling information. Like, what do I do? And we've always historically been really good at finding loopholes. Um, so for instance, in New York, where we were not allowed to sell, we discovered that um, it wasn't that you weren't allowed to sell, you just weren't allowed to physically spit in the state. And I was like, that's great. People can spit in New Jersey. Um, and so we'd found kind of this loophole. Like customers <laughs> used to have to attest that they had not physically spat in the state. Um, <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time figuring out, like, what's the, like, how do I work around this? And to be honest, like one of the workarounds today is that you put what we call sort of a dock in the box. Like, you have a telemedicine doctor where you just can call, uh, or sorry, it's just like they are kind of like on the back end, like you not even necessarily see it and they order it for you. And when you have that, you can kind of circumvent, you can become a, a laboratory developed test. And there was one regulator in particular who um, I met with and she goes, you know, Anne, like what you're trying to do is fundamentally really disruptive. Like you're trying to allow consumers to get direct access to care without having to go through a medical provider. And if you succeed in that, you can really have an impact, a real positive impact on the system. But doing that is not a workaround. It's hard work. Like either you decide you wanna put your head down and you wanna just like really get that work done, or you find if you wanna sell this company in a couple of years, like you do this workaround and you're just, like whatever, you're just circumventing the system. But, but you can change the system. And that conversation had a huge impact. And I said, I said, look, like, I'm in it for the next, you know, I'm in it for life. So I'm willing to do the hard work. And you know, it took us, um, you know, from that moment, it was a couple of years before we actually got our first approval. And the way we did it, people always ask, like, what'd you do? And in some ways, when you're in a hole like that, um, no one, like the regulators did not trust us. And so the way that you win back trust, especially with an organization like the FDA, is they speak in data. Like you guys probably all work with people who like, like they understand data, like show us the data and like then we can make a decision. And so we did, 
Um, you know, one of the other things I learned with the FDA, too, um, I always tell my kids this, I learned obedience. Um, I learned that when you go to the DMV, you know, you don't argue about standing in line or you don't argue about doing a vision test. You just do it. You don't try to say, like, oh, I just had one last week. Here's the report. Um, you just do it. And similar to the FDA, um, you have to recognize they sometimes know more than you do because they're seeing the whole picture. And you just do it. You, like, you negotiate, but you do, the pro you do what they ask you to do. And um, in some ways, by showing that we could be obedient and we could follow directions and that we had the data to prove it, um, and we had to change a lot of things within the company to be a regulated company. And there's a lot um, that we had to do from an engineering and product and design perspective to document how everything happens. Um, and so, again, it's been a ton of work, but it's fundamentally made us a much better company because our processes are much stronger. Um, so it was, um, it definitely was rough, and there was a lot of um, controversy within the company about whether or not this was the right path. And I think as a leader of the company, one of the most important things to do is to allow controversy, you know, allow people to, have to voice their questions like, and voice it. Like I think Google is one thing I learned with Google is like, you want to let people debate. Debate is really good. Um, but once you make a decision, everyone's on board. And if you don't agree, then it's not the right place. Um, but we had we have a fair amount of debate, and before like we I encourage that as a leader I encourage that debate, and then once we make a decision and you can set a vision for the future and say look like we're we're trying to fundamentally change the system we're like trying to empower consumers like my next thing like why do you have to go and get a doctor's order to get a blood test do you always need it for a prescription like all these like the whole you know um, patriarchal system like why do you actually need like, why do you need this physician or medical um, involvement before you can actually get some of this information? So we're really out for that bigger picture of like trying to change the system. So for your current offerings, you offer the ancestry test, and then you can get the health test. All Correct. Day. So for two years, we um, we just kind of we all we did was offer ancestry, and we focused on pulling out the health information. We've gotten we have three FDA approvals now or authorizations. So we have carrier status. Um, we have genetic, which is things like cystic fibrosis. We have genetic health risks, which is things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. Um, and then we have now the breast cancer variants, the three most common in Jewish women um, or Jewish individuals that we test for those variants. Um, are you planning to offer more extensive testing, like such as uh, metabolic imbalances and enzymes? Like what? Like because um, I have a, a Googler asking. Um, oh. his family member has chronic pain. And I think so. No, I mean we're focusing on DNA. Like if it's if it's a genetic variant of a test that we could detect, like we're focusing just on DNA right now. Um, so we definitely think about partnerships that we could do that would have um, you know especially anything that we could do that's potentially at home, mm -hmm. um, where we could allow you to have at home collection and think about other tests that you're getting. But right now it's just focused. Like we're definitely looking to expand the the tests that we're offering, um, but everything will be just based on genetics. Excellent. Um, so given the large corpus of data you're putting together, mm -hmm. um, are you, how have you been able to use this like for promoting cures or new developments in the field? We do, so that was part of the hypothesis of the company is that if I collect all of this information and all of this data, can I then more effectively make discoveries, academic research discoveries, as well as can I translate this information into drug therapeutics? So the drug industry, again, when I was running this, this when I was investing in companies and running that fund that I called Death Watch, um, part of the reason why I could do something like that is statistically, 90% of everything fails in biotech. So if 90% of everything fails, like you just short everything. Like there's like you don't have to do that much math for it. Like it was just like you can predict failures. Um, so in in the drug discovery business, it, the pharma lobbying group is the only group I know that like would actively promote every year how it's more and more expensive to create a drug. So like when I started investing, it was $700 million to make a drug, and today it's close to $3 billion. So it's only getting worse. So the idea with all this data is can I in some ways more effectively use this data to, to translate it into drug hypotheses, and then do I have a higher success rate for making therapeutics? So we are doing that now. We hired Richard Scheller, who was the head of research and development at Genentech. Um, we have over 10 programs in development now. We've been doing this now for three years. We work with a ton of pharma partnerships. Um, so we are actively trying to say, can you turn 
data into curative therapeutics. So we are actively working on that now, and my hope is like, again, because we're a scientific team, like, I can say this is a hypothesis, and I, but I can't make any claims yet, but my hope is in 10 years I can come back and say, like, look, here's our success rate compared to industry averages, and we believe that that success rate will come because we're starting with something that's data-driven based on genetics. Now, is that possibly a new business model for the users of 23andMe also? Like, if I provide you with health data, it leads to some type of cure? It's hard to translate. Um, the reality with drug development is that drug development is um, it's a really long and complicated process. So at what point in time can I um, identify that like your participation made such a huge difference? So what we tried to do is say like we're learning from our customers. So for instance, in depression, we did a study where we had 400,000 customers participate, and thanks to the participation of so many individuals, um, we were able to make discoveries in depression. And then you potentially can analyze all those genetic variants and say, these are, these, this is one where we think this is potentially a druggable target. Um, so it's really hard to do the micro attribution to say, hey, these individuals, and plus it's like a 10 to 15 year process. So you might come back and say, hey, 15 years later. What, what we have found is what people really care about. Um, like we had a community of individuals, actually it was someone from Google actually who we worked with who had sarcoma. She's like, I don't care, like, what I care about is a cure. Like, I, I have sarcoma. Like, I have a lethal disease. Like, I would like to live. And um, I find people with serious illnesses like that, they care about two things. Like, does this impact my children? And I would like to survive. But me coming to you and saying, here's a check for $100, I'm sorry, you're gonna die soon. Like, is not, is like, it, it, like we wanna do the right thing. And to, I, everything at 23andMe, um, all of our decisions that we make are about what is in the best interest of our customers. And my customer is always the individuals who've signed up. And so we always think about everything from the perspective of like, you just participate in research, like what is it that is in the best interest for you? And if you tell me, for instance, that you have, you have migraines and you have um, you know, uh, you know, Crohn's, well, we, it's our job then to help you figure out the best ways that you can participate in research or for us to actually move those things forward to have some kind of impact in your life. And then you could potentially help be a control. There might be somebody here who's like, oh, I'm high, you know, I have a family history of prostate cancer and we have depression. And you can say, I can be a control for you. And in that way, everybody's actually helping each other. So it's hard to then point to, well, who exactly is responsible? Because the reality, it's really a community asset. That makes sense. Um, for the survey aspect, when you're a member of 23andMe, yeah. they ask you questions. Um, sometimes you probably might get data that is just erroneous. Like, do you use like multiple data points to figure out? We do. One of the things we found, so this is a good example, in, um, we, ask, we put out questions to our customers. So we ask, we have a pretty comprehensive survey that we first ask everyone to take. Um, and sometimes you have to refine the question. So in this day and age, everybody thinks they have celiac disease. Um, but very few people have actually gotten a biopsy. So if I ask people, have you had celiac disease, the genetic associations known, previously known to occur with that, don't replicate. But if I ask you, do you have celiac and have you had a biopsy to confirm it, then I can actually hit the replication. I, like, get the, I, I can find in the genetic studies the known, the known findings. So we do find that we have to triangulate questions quite a bit. Um, Again, it's one of the things that I learned from Google and sort of like big data people is that it's much better to have like massive amounts of dirty data. And um, for us, you know, we have now 5 million customers. We have over 1.5 billion data points on those customers. Um, we have the potential to do a lot of research. It's without a doubt, there's, it's not perfect. Like not everybody, um, um, you know, reports everything perfectly, but it's pretty good. And if I ask you, for instance, like, do you have epilepsy? You can probably report that pretty accurately. And so what we find is that there's almost, um, um, you know, it's, it's almost a false truth that like, oh, a clinical trial is perfect data. It was one thing I learned when I was on Wall Street is how much when you have a multi-center trial, if you have 20 different centers, trying to diagnose a partial response in cancer is really controversial. So um, a lot of aspects of medicine, like defining a phenotype, is controversial. And in some ways, the best thing that 23andMe does is we have it all in a very standardized form. And we always have the ability to go back to our customers and ask. 
and say, okay, if you said you had asthma, now we're gonna go back and ask you and ask you more about like your medications, your like when does it occur, and you can start to weed out when something doesn't look real. Now, I'm sure people have seen the information and they might have overreacted or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered like maybe connecting 23andMe to like genetic counseling or providing people information on how to talk about these results with the primary care physician? Right. We do actually connect people. Um, so we don't, the main thing that we try to do that we feel really strongly about is that healthcare, infer like a physician involvement or a genetic counselor is up to you. And so we never use that as a bottleneck for access to your information. But if you find out, for instance, that you're positive for breast cancer, um, the BRCA mutation, you know, you want to follow up with a physician or a genetic counselor. And so we have had partnerships in the past, and we look at doing that more and more, is where you, we might at least give you advice, like, hey, here's resources where you can go to. Um, but we don't ever, we feel, again, philosophically as a company, we feel really strongly that it's never a bottleneck for access, but we do provide resources for people so they know how to follow up. Um, for my friends who have convinced to try to use 23andMe, some of them have told me, well, the reason why I don't want to do it is because if I know that I could be susceptible to a heart attack or some other um, health problem, I'd rather like be left um, not knowing the situation. And then I've heard people who have said, well, now that I know I could possibly have a health issue, it might stress me out or something. Um, have you done any research about like the psychological aspects? Of we have um, we have done a lot of research, and actually one of the best studies that was out there, there was a guy named Robert Green who's at Harvard, and he did the original studies on Alzheimer's and looking at people. It was a series of studies called Reveal where he was able to see that people, like Alzheimer's is one of the more extreme. So people find out they're genetically high risk for Alzheimer's, um, what do they do? And he found that initially there is anxiety, um, but after three months you return to baseline. And for a lot of these individuals, they already know there's a family history. So for instance, for people who have, um, again, the Alzheimer's variant, if there's a high genetic risk factor, like you probably have someone in your family network who's had Alzheimer's. So you know that you have some kind of genetic risk factor already. So what we find, and for me, the story of genetics, the reason why I was so interested in genetics is that you do have genes and environment. So your genetics are not, unless it's Huntington's, like it's not deterministic. It's not 100%. You have this whole beautiful world of your environment. And so, to me, the environment is your responsibility. Like, that's what you can do. Like, you can do something every single day to influence your environment. So without a doubt, there's, there's people who are genetically high risk for Alzheimer's, but they don't get it. And so why? Like, that's one thing I'm really pas passionate about personally is looking at who are the people who are genetically high risk for diseases who never get them? And what was it in their environment? And the reality is, like, goes back to sort of the original premise of the company, like, one of the issues is, like, being really healthy doesn't make money in the system. But 23andMe is really uniquely set up in large, in m many ways to do research on prevention. So it's one of the things we're really passionate about is, like, look at the people who have Alzheimer's and say, okay, is it interval training? Is it, like, extreme exercise? Like, what is it that really has an influence on your life? And can we then help people take responsibility on a daily basis to try and actually help prevent diseases. Everyone knows you're, everyone gets sick at something. Like, every, like, it's one of the things I always say, people would say, oh, you're just gonna have all these healthy people. And I was like, there's no such thing as a healthy person. Everyone has something. It's like, it could be depression, it could be migraines, it could be, you know, stomach problems, celiac, like anything. There's no such thing as someone who's like 100% healthy. So like, for me, part of it was like, helping people realize um, that like your health is really a sum of your actions every day. Like, and for us to be able to do that research on like what is it in our environment that we can really do. And the thing that I take most pride in is like rather than us creating any kind of anxiety or, or other issues, is what people do is like people are looking to, to make change. Like people get their genetic information and it's something in black and white and then they're looking to make a change. And I think the, the, the number one disservice that the healthcare industry has right now is there's not great support for changing your behavior. And people don't know how. So often, like we heard this um, with Alzheimer's, I had one doctor, he could, stood up at a conference and complained, he goes, you know, one of the biggest problems with 23andMe is you generate non-billable questions. And, um, and the reality is like you show up and you say, oh, I'm genetically high risk for Alzheimer's, and they're like, well, come back when you have Alzheimer's. Like, that's what we do. Um, but the reality, like, when you think about where do you go to prevent, the number one place where people go to prevent any kind of disease in this country is realistically Walmart. 
Like, it's a behavior, like, the average American goes to Walmart three times a week, or in this day and age, it's gonna be Amazon. Like, it's, it's, it's your shopping, it's your consumer, it's like how you are living your life every day. And one of the things I really try to home in on, on our customers, hammer in on our customers, is like, your health is a sum of what you do every single day. And so, again, going back to the gene and environment pitch, like, it is like, you can control your environment. You can't control your genes, but you can control your environment. And we are trying to make those discoveries about what in your environment is potentially gonna influence your genes the most. So for the people who are fearful about putting their information yeah. into the system, um, one thing I keep on hearing is, like, how do I know that my genetic information will not fall into the wrong hands? Like recently we heard about another genetic company, I guess yeah. they were hacked or whatnot. So for someone who's fearful about sharing information to 23andMe, like what would you say to them? It was one of the things early on um, for people who are privacy, we spent a lot of time with privacy experts in the early days and, and it was one of the things I concluded early on, it was like for people who are like really care, I was like don't do it. Just don't, like, like spend the time, like get comfortable with it. Um, you know, what we can do as a company, because um, there's a lot of irrational fears, and that's why we used to say that. As a company, um, we have to do everything we can to protect privacy. Like, there's fundamentally no business model. Like, I'm totally dependent on my customers' participation and their trust in what, to, to do the research and to do the types of things we wanna do. So I have no business model if I can't protect the privacy of my customers. Um, so we do a lot, like from a database infrastructure, how we set it up, um, to even the fact that it's not a swab, it is uh, two mils of saliva. We reject samples if we don't get enough saliva. So you can't be accidentally swabbed while you're sleeping, like it's a lot, you'll never drool that much in your sleep. Um, and so we've set up the company and also we don't have what we call like the legal chain of custody. So if you order five kits, I have no idea if you spat or if you gave them away to five random people in this room. So I don't have the direct tracing back to, to individuals. Um, from our terms of service as well, we've, we've you know, specifically said it's not to be used for law enforcement. Um, and, and we've set up the company in such a way to make sure that it is really hard. Like we have not gotten a subpoena on this. We've put out a transparency report. Um, we would do everything we can to fight a subpoena. Um, it hasn't happened for us, but those are the types of things where um, for people who are really, really concerned, like just don't do it. Um, for people who like are comfortable with being on the web, um, we do everything we can to protect their privacy. Um, and one of the core elements, like one of the leading privacy experts, one of the things he taught me was like, look, Anne, what privacy people really want is they want choice and they want transparency, they wanna know. So if you're a 23andMe and you don't wanna share your data, like, don't share it, and we have, we have to respect that. So if you don't want to participate in research, you don't have to participate. If you don't want to share your genetic data with me, don't share it. Um, if you want to share it with you know five people in this room, we allow you to share it. So we've given you a lot of controls, and that's also one of the things that's relatively atypical in healthcare. Like, if you wanted to share your medical record with me, it would be almost impossible. Um, so we do a lot to make sure that we're like empowering people to have that privacy um, and then have also the ability to, to compare when they want. One of the things I just say about there is like when, when people in general talk about privacy, um, like if I picked anyone randomly in this room, like I'm sure your genetics would be really interesting and I would love to see them, um, but your bank account is always much more interesting. And so from a desire to hack in to you know, one or the other, your bank is just a lot more interesting. And so when I look at like everyone's DNA um, and when I think about privacy, it's, it's significantly less on a mass area, but what you see is like within a family, people will say, I wanna see if my brother is really related. Like, is, is he really my full brother? Um, and so you get some of those intra-family privacy questions rather than necessarily a broad sweep. And on a policy level, um, yeah. are there things that 23, are there policies or legislation that 23andMe is backing on the federal level that's? We backed, in the early days, there was something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and it passed unanimously, bipartisan. Um, it is a, it's the, it prevents, um, it prevents insurance companies, health insurance companies and employers from using genetic information for discrimination. So that was a huge step for us. It does not, it leaves health insurance outside. Um, I'm sorry, it leaves life insurance outside. Um, but that was, a, that was a, a pretty significant step forward in terms of giving federal protection to help people feel comfortable that they can keep their genetic information to themselves. 
Regarding the life insurance aspect, is there other legislation that's going to be proposed in the future? I haven't seen anything um, now. And it's interesting to me because it's been 10 years, and there hasn't really been any movement or any interest necessarily from life insurance on it. Um, the reality we find, too, is genetic information is complicated. Like, it's not well understood yet. So exactly how would you, like, we already know, like, some of the biggest risk factors, obesity, smoking, um, you know, like, those are, those are the biggest out there. So other than, like, okay, you're genetically high risk for a condition that we just don't fully understand yet, um, like, I'm much more optimistic about, like, in my dream world that we would actually have insurance companies embracing it and says, okay, you're genetically high risk for a blood clot and you're a woman. You potentially are higher risk than for miscarriage and pregnancy. We're going to try to, like, mitigate those risks by, you know, X number of measures. Like, there's things I wish the healthcare system would adopt with genetic information rather than being reactive, um, but that hasn't really happened yet. So going forward for, like, the next... 10 years of 23andMe, like where, where do you see yourself as a company? I think um, one of the most interesting things I see happening finally is that there is an interesting world of virtual healthcare. So, you know, like Vic, who used to run Google Plus here, who's now at a company called AliveCore, um, you know, my dad has AFib and he has a little device on his phone that measures your EKG and it will tell you whether you're in atrial fibrillation. Like, that's amazing. It's totally amazing. Like, you don't have to go in. It's like you can get instant real-time information. We're on the beach in Hawaii, and he's like, oh, I'm in AFib. Um, like, it's, it's so, it's like, it's, it's utterly amazing. And I think that there is, um, there's genuinely a world that is coming where you're going to be able to get a lot of your healthcare on your phone. And is it taking a picture of your mole and then sending it in and you can get multiple opinions? Is it someone like Grand Rounds where you get multiple opinions online? Like, there's, there's like one of, the, one of the things I'm really hopeful for is that healthcare becomes less about the art of medicine and much more data driven. Where you get some, you know, a number of people, a number of opinions looking at a case. And, um, and you can have, like, again, on the thing like a mole, you can really apply machine learning to that. And so, what are ways? Like, I see a whole new world that is really cropping up. Um, and whether it's going to be, you know, some kind of chat bot that's telemedicine, like, there's a lot that's happening there. So when I think about 23andMe's role, I think that we become the hub in a large part. Like, we are, like, your genetic information is the core. It's like the genetic code of you. It's, it is, it's like the, it's the digital representation of you. And so we're the, we're the epicenter of it. And then helping you figure out all the different ways that you can navigate that information and what can you do with that information. And we can't do that alone. Like, that's where we need partners. Like, I need ways that you can potentially analyze your blood at home instantly, or that you could get, you know, you could, you know, take a picture of your mole and have it analyzed. Like, a whole way that you can actually start to think about measuring yourself at home, not in like, like the quantified self movement is, is more extreme, but like ways like the average individual wants to just like be healthy and proactive. So I think that there's a whole new world that is coming up, which is almost virtual healthcare. And I think the brick and mortar is, um, you know, we'll always have hospitals and we'll always have brick and mortar, but, um, you know, the same way there's blockbusters out there still, um, there's not a lot. Um, and I think that more and more you're going to see that. Like, I don't think that you, doctors' visits are going to be very different in the future. And, and I think that's where um, my hope is, like, the research that 23andMe can do is that we will make a number of discoveries about you know, what, does, what is the meaning of your genetic information, and then also what are really meaningful ways that you can prevent. And, and that's like, when I think about my ultimate success, it's, you know, I would like to have cures. I'd love to have a cures for Parkinson's and other diseases, and that is a high priority, and we're booking on that. Um, but I'd also love to be able to tell a 20-year-old, like, this is what you need to do to be able to live to be healthy at 100. And, and to me, that's like, that's, that's real success. So this kind of goes into life extension. Uh, I don't, I think life, life extension, <laughs> life extension is like, it's, it's, again, there's a lot of Silicon Valley discussion of like, oh, I want to live to a 500. Um, I think it's like, my goal is like very, like, I would just like to be healthy at 100. Um, like when I read stories about, you know, like 100 year olds running the marathons and like doing things, like, that's what you want to do. I don't want to be like in a critical care unit, like supported at 100, like, no, I want to be healthy. Like, I don't want to be diabetic and have congestive heart disease. Like, no. Like, just let me be healthy and tell me how. 
And again, it goes back to this like mantra of like health is what you do every single day. Like I dress like this because like I'm I'm googly, um, but also because I exercise all the time. Like I biked here, I'll bike back, I'll bike home. Like. I'm always like, I love to humiliate people in the office when they take the elevator. I'm like, why? Like, why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do it in front of me, too? Um, <laughs> um, so I think it's really important to like, get some of those types of messages out. Excellent. Um, so now we're going to go to audience questions. So if anyone has a question, please head over to the mic. You can just, there's a mic right there. You can just. Yeah. I'm going to check for online questions, too. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. I'm from Argentina. And there when, when I go to the doctor with the 23 me report, the doctor typically they tell me something like, hey, why, why did you do this uh, as if I, I did something wrong? Like, wh why did you do this without asking a doctor first? And so my, one of my questions is related is if you are doing something to educate them yeah. in that sense. And also, when I see the, um, the possibilities to get a disease, they are all taken in, uh, with, uh, into account, compared with um, people, Caucasic people in Europe, because most researches are done, done there. But I'm from Latin America, so I, I don't feel represented. I know that, but my question is, um, if you're going to do something to have more samples from that region, yeah. so I, um, I know that my test, the results are more uh, um, accuracy. The yeah, word. sure. And also, for example, in Argentina, you, you don't have that. I mean, you can't use 23 me. you have to come here. Right. So that's the question. Yeah, so first question on physicians and second on international. Um, so physicians are definitely the last mile. Like, it's painful for us. And, um, and it's disappointing to me because we get a lot of people who take their reports to physicians and the physician says, uh, like, this is not worthwhile. Um, so you're not alone in that. And we've tried some initiatives, and early initiatives, to, to work with and educate doctors. And I always joke, if I took 1,000 kits to Stanford Shopping Center, and I was like, these are free, they would be gone in five minutes. Um, if I took 1,000 kits to ASCO, the big oncology meeting, I would come home with 990 of them. Um, like, we've literally tried to give away kits to doctors, and they're like, oh, no. Um, so there's a huge, like, there's a lot of work that we have to do to engage the medical community. Um, one thing that I have found is that there's, like, there's a new crop of physicians, like a lot of doctors who are online in the telemedicine. And it's something that we're thinking about is how do we cultivate the physicians who are trying to embrace a world of prevention and like what could you do with this? And it's it's hard because like it's not it's not a big reimbursement. Like any you can go to any dermatologist and get Botox like today in the next hour. And if you said I want to get a mole check, they'll be like, oh, in October I have time at nine. <laughs> um, so and that's because a mole check doesn't reimburse, but Botox is you know three hundred dollars in fifteen minutes. So. Um, so I think that's where like, we have a lot to do to try to work with the physician world. We're hiring someone. Like, that's, that's like a big initiative for me on the team is how do we engage the medical world. Um, second on international, the same way we had regulatory issues here, the rest of the world is pretty complicated. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about genetics. Um, so each country has laws about how to enter into those countries, um, and they're pretty complicated. It's almost like we just haven't had, like I think a lot of startups fail because they try to do too much too early. So we think about international, and honestly, like again, going back to the love of hacks, one of the ways I've thought about just hacking it is just like, just be in like JFK in Miami and like try to, because then you can actually pull a lot of diversity in without necessarily having. So, or like, and the reality is like the US is this like beautiful melting pot where if I want, you know, instead of going into China, which is really complicated, like I can go to San Francisco. And so like for me, part of it is making sure that we're recruiting the right populations. And so we are looking specifically at targeting different groups. Like we have a big African-American initiative. Um, you know, we have a, um, a, a whole global initiative of like countries where we're trying to get specific populations, um, both for the ancestry testing so that we can improve our product, but also then for having the diversity in, in health research. Thank you. So I'm going to take an online question. Yeah. Um, who owns the IP produced from an individual's genotyping data when they use 23andMe? So there's no IP in that capacity. So like if you, you own, what happens like if you spit, you own your data. Um, if you consent for research, you're consenting to be part of this aggregate. So for instance, if I discover 
that, um, you know, here's a, like I talk about 400,000 people participated in the depression study. And so um, there's not IP on, on genes. So we're not filing patents, for instance, on like, oh, this genetic association is part of, Parkin of you know, depression. So there's no IP on that. We might say, oh, this, this, this mutation looks like it's potentially in, a, in an area where it's potentially druggable. We then make a small molecule or an antibody, and we're going to target that. That is our IP. Because like, in some ways, it's, it's so far downstream from everything. Our hope is like we are publishing and putting out into the public world like all of the genetic associations that we're finding. So we like to publish a lot. We have over 100 publications out there. Um, but we really look at like the long-term downstream. Like We're owning that IP because we're putting in, like again, what's going to end up being hundreds of millions of dollars of work into trying to make successful discoveries. Excellent. That will be cures. Hi, and thank you so much for coming. I'm sure. really inspired. I'm Noga. I'm the Google Doodles PM. Oh. I wanted to ask about how you attract and retain so many women. I, from everyone I talk to in your company, they're so happy there. How do you do it? Especially now, uh, really, especially now yeah. that so many women are feeling like they're, they can't stay in tech long term. I, um, you know, we had a problem for a while where um, we could, like, we were trying really hard to hire a man for the management team. Um, <laughs> And I remember it was like they were looking for a head of engineering at one point. And I remember we just like we had this woman and we're like, no, 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 we need a man. Like we need at least one. Um, so I think, um, I mean, I think it's like all aspects of diverse. Like I think we've tried really hard to have um, a supportive environment. And for me, like I've worked. I always say I was like I've worked for really bad people. I worked for like some really complicated. Funds like I, I was like, who in the room has anyone who's been in jail? Like I have bosses who've been in jail. So like, I've worked <laughs> for like some really um, <laughs> challenging individuals. So I know what it's like, um, and I'm trying to do the exact opposite. Like the first job I ever had, um, the Wallenberg family in Sweden, they were amazing. Like I've never like they treated me so well. So I know what it's like to have a bad job in a bad environment. I know what it's like to have a great environment. And in Sweden, for instance, like this woman showed up one day. And I was like, who are you? And she was like, oh, I'm newly promoted partner. I've been on maternity leave for two years. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so it, like, it was one of those things, like, culturally, it's set to me. Like, here's a group of people, the Wallenberg, like, who promoted this woman who's like, been on maternity leave for two years. It was amazing. And so I really try to create a culture where we support people through their life cycle. And um, you know, a lot of people have been at the company who they get married, they've had kids, they get divorced. Like, like there's a whole life cycle, and not everyone is awesome every day. And so, like, you could be awesome for a while, and then you have a kid, and it's like, and the kid's sick for a while, and you have to take off time. Like, I can't be the asshole boss that's like, oh my god, you're out. Um, like, I have, like, I have to support people, and I look at people for the sum of like, I hope people stay for ten years. And I look at people for the sum, like what can you can you contribute in that in that period, and like how do we also support you? Um, we're really very much like your family is your family, but like we're your family away from home, and so like I have to support people in a good way, and I have to listen, um, and and I think it's like there's a level of humility. Like the number one thing we have for hiring is humility. Like, uh, like you need really smart people, but like I just. The culturally, like y y you got to fit in with the humility, and we have to support people. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thanks for doing this. Of course. Um, so, I know there might be some liabilities associated with the idea I'm about to mention, but is there some time when this would be an opportunity finding tool as well that your DNA seems like you would be perfect for pole vaulting? So you know. Practice away. <laughs> uh, I think, um, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get down to those types of specifics. Like, mm -hmm. I think, um, um, you know, I think that, there, like, for sprinting, you know, there's genetic variants associated with, like, do you have the double twitch? Um, will it ever refine enough to be able to say, like, oh, you know, you're really great at this specific sport. I think, again, it goes back to the world of genes and environment. Like, you, you, ha you need passion. Mm -hmm. To be great at anything, you need passion. Like, the, the, the most important aspect for me out of that movie, Gattaca, was that this guy has a genetic, like, he's genetically not likely to survive for some reason, but he has the passion 
and like passion accounts for so much. Um, so I think without a doubt, you'll hear things like if you are, we did some research at one point on um, um, you know, like being toned or like having a, a, a musical ear. And you know, you could imagine at some point, like, would you say, okay, like, hey, you know, you're just not like you just if you want to be a pianist, you're gonna have to work that much harder. So I think it's mm -hmm. you know, we and we're the, yeah. like we did a study for instance in weight loss. Like we my hope one day is to be able to say, if you're overweight, you it's only gonna take you four weeks to lose weight. You, it's gonna take you seven weeks. Like you're just genetically more likely yeah. to not be able to lose that weight. And I think that's where it will help people not say not know like, oh, you're not gonna be great at this, but like you just might have to work harder. Instead of the famous 10,000 hours, you need yeah. 12,000 hours. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thanks Hi. for coming, this is very interesting. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, I noticed that, I mean, so there's 23andMe, but there's also lots of other, um, lots of other sort of similar con um, companies. So if you're looking at sort of ancestry, yeah. you get to link and find out your relatives who are with 23andMe, but then there's people who are with other companies, it seems like everything's kind of siloed. Have you thought about talking to other companies and seeing if there are ways that you can connect across each other's databases to help people find relatives? Yeah, to I think um, with other companies, we did a promotion, for instance, on DNA Day, where we allowed people from Ancestry.com to upload their data. Hmm. Um, you know, the companies are pretty competitive right now, so there yeah. hasn't um, been any specific initiative to like try. Like, you can always download and I think upload. Mm -hmm. um, so, so no, I mean, I, it's, it's a problem. Like, it's not yeah. in the best interest of customers, for no. sure, to not allow. Like, I would think that that would actually be something that's great. But, like, I think there's a lot of competition right now, so that hasn't, that hasn't happened. Um, but without a doubt, like, we know that people who are looking for family members oftentimes will do both services. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, and, and again, we might do more in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, this goes with some of the privacy issues. Like, we mm -hmm. had... Um, so again, for, you talk about the Golden State Killer, like one of the things that's important for us to do from a privacy perspective is not allow um, relative matches from DNA that's uploaded. Right. Because if you allow that, then you open up the door for things like the Golden State Killer. Mm -hmm. And so we had, like for instance, when we did this promotion with, um, you know, anyone could upload their DNA from other places, we would tell you if there was someone within your close circle, but we wouldn't identify who it is. Mm. And we did that, and you would have to spit again then. And we did that specifically so that you, like from a privacy perspective. We think a lot about privacy. Well, thanks. Okay. Uh, hi, and so say I submit my uh, spit, and then I get it back, and then it tells me about um, like my ancestry and, uh, well, my health prospects. Um, say I have like a, like what would be like, is there a way I could prevent myself from having like cancer in the future, like just, off of that? We don't have, so the, the, the cancer report we have right now is the breast cancer report that is associated with um, typically, you know, Ashkenazi Jewish descent, and, um, and it does have a high penetration of cancer. So meaning like those people are likely to get cancer. What we found people have done is they go and they get either mastectomy or they take out their ovaries. Um, so there's ways that you can potentially, like it's extreme, to prevent, um, you know, the other thing that's out there is there are, for instance, there's people who are genetically high risk for colon cancer. And in that capacity, you know, right now, I think the recommendations are col colonoscopies at 45. In that case, you could start having colonoscopies earlier. So a lot of it, there's not necessarily known specifics about, okay, if you wanna prevent cancer, these are the things that you do. Um, in every disease area, you can say, you know, don't smoke, exercise, and um, eat better. And what we find that having something that is a risk factor in black and white in your DNA motivates people to actually do all those things. Mm -hmm. But those are the biggest swing factors you have always is your exercise and your diet and your environment. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hi, my Hi. name is Yulia and I'm an intern in Google Brain Genomics. Mm. And looks like Google is also looking into like genetics and predicting disease from, from genetics and also connecting it to healthcare. Yeah. I know that also Microsoft is looking into um, healthcare and genetics. So what do you think about this? Like, do you think that you will collaborate with Google or Microsoft at some point or you will be competitors or 23andMe is so far ahead in this research that... I think, 
So I, I've spent a lot of time, like in, in the early days, like back when we were starting the company, like Google, Microsoft, others. Like Microsoft had a, had um, RFPs out for a while doing genetic research. They've had a great, you know, they have they had a really great team. Um, you know, Google Brain team is amazing. Um, I know Jeff Dean well. Like it's an amazing group of people that are there. The number one problem in healthcare I find is nobody has the data set. Like I love going to big data meetings and everyone's like talking about big data and I'm like, but you don't have any data. Like, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating. I'm like, like it's like the emperor has no clothes, people. Like there's not a lot of data out there. So, I mean, there's some of these big initiatives and my whole goal was like, I want the data. Like 23andMe's initial premise, I was like, you need to generate the data first. And so the number one thing that we have is we have a massive living data set where when I can go back to my customers and say, okay, do you have migraines? Can you tell me more information? And for those customers who want to participate, they can tell me more. And so it's, it's one of the things, like there's the UK biobank and there's all these other biobanks out there, but they're static. Like we did this project with this one group in the UK and I, I requested samples. It was a recontactable database. I requested samples. Three years later, they called me and they're like, we have the samples. I was like, who are you? Like, what is, <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. Like, that's their definition of recontactable. Like, in this world of like the internet age, like, just text me or like send me a message. Like, have it like show up as an alert on my phone. So that's the main thing. Like, the, the, the key that we created, I needed to first create the data before I can solve the problems. There's amazing people out there who can solve the problems, but it's really hard. There's no one else out there who has the amount of data we have. We'd love to, like, and they said, we, I, I know Jeff Dean, I know that team well, if you know Lizzie, like all, like, we love that team. We're always open to working. Or just join us. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and another question. Oh, I, I, we're gonna make this the last question. Okay. Oh, so can I? Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I saw that 23andMe is hiring machine learning specialists. Mm -hmm. so, so to which extent does 23andMe use machine learning or is it mostly looking into literature and see which, which variant is connected to which disease from literature? So we do a lot, we, we have a pipeline where we're doing our own genome-wide association studies quite a bit. Um, we are starting to do a fair amount of machine learning um, and thinking about, so for instance, like one of the first applications probably is in ancestry and helping people and predicting ancestry. Um, we have a number of initiatives in house and those are the types of things we've thought of. But like, again, with, with, all, of, with all of the data that we have, we're, we're ripe for all those technologies now, like, like all the applications. So again, my job is like being somebody who's not technical is like I'm trying to create first like this massive enthusiasm from the world to participate in research and like to learn about their genetics and then create data that has like the highest the data quality that we need to do that research and then to empower everybody with all the different techniques and skills like to then analyze the data and what can we do with it. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you. Well, Anne, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Let's you. give her a round of applause. Thank you.